Good afternoon. Glad to see those that have returned are really, really interested in other oilseed crops. I think they're some of the most interesting crops that we'll talk about besides canola. I've been working on oil. I work for the USDA Agricultural Research Service. I'm a soil scientist. I started on oil seeds in about 2003. Primary reason that we were evaluating uh, uh, oil seeds was to see how well they fit into uh, a high value irrigated vegetable production systems and later on what the potential was for utilizing those uh, those oil seeds uh, uh, oil for um, a, an alternative energy uh, source. Uh, of all the crops uh, that, that we grew in our variety trials, I think safflower turned out to be the easiest to grow. Uh, it's a, it's a, a quite unique crop. And what I'm going to do is uh, not, I'm going to give you a background on what safflower is, talk about a few, a little bit about the production practices, uh, some yields, and I don't think I'll have time to get to water use because of the size of the panel here. But there was a poster up uh, earlier um, in the meeting, uh, and if you had a chance to look at that, or if you have any questions on water use, uh, uh, give, you can give me a call here at, at, at Prosser. Okay. So safflower, um, it's a native to the Middle East uh, uh, and Asia and Africa. It's, a, and, um, it's an annual, it's a member of the uh, sunflower family, it's a composite. It looks much like uh, uh, thistle when, it, when it's growing. And what's really interesting, it, it really didn't become a, a commercial crop in the U.S. until after the 1950s and into the 1960s. Initial research started in uh, 1925 when it was brought into the Midwestern uh, uh, Great Plains uh, areas. And then as it shows here that uh, production uh, really began in the 50s. Uh, most of the production now is concentrated in the western United States, the, the, drier, the drier regions, and, uh, as well as the Canadian prairie provinces. California grows uh, over 60% of all of U.S. safflower, and then that's followed by North Dakota, Montana, uh, South Dakota, uh, Utah, Idaho, um, Arizona, Nebraska, they all have very small acreages. You know, we're talking maybe uh, 2,000 to 5,000 acres for the entire fire state. Um, the total acreage in 2011 was 140,000 acres. So it's, you can see that it's really qu quite a minor crop. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, 1991, it was about 400,000 acres, and it's been declining uh, uh, ever, ever since. And I'm not quite sure uh, what, the, what the reason is behind that. It, uh, the crop grows well in dry land as well as uh, irrigated areas. It's really a good fit into uh, small grain rotations. It has a very high drought tolerance. Uh, it's thistle-like, as I said. It, it, it has a, a main stem and then a number of side branches that come out, and there could be anywhere from eight to ten heads on uh, side branches. There's a plant right down below here if uh, you want to look at it a little later. Uh, the, heads, the heads each have about 15 to 30 seeds. Uh, they're small, white, looks like a barley, uh, a little larger than wheat. Um, they're typically 35 to 42 percent oil, depending on what variety is grown. They uh, grow to one to four feet in height. The height is dependent, of course, on what the, what the precipitation for the region is. Taller varieties, uh, the taller it gets is uh, higher, higher uh, rainfall areas. And it has a very deep taproot, very similar to that of, uh, of canola. And it can go up to eight to 10 feet. Well, one of the main uses of this oil were for, uh, uh, were for oil, meal, and birdseed. And birdseed by far is the biggest uh, uh, um, industry uh, uh, for, the, for the seed. But traditionally, safflower was grown for its flowers. And it was used for uh, making uh, dyes for clothing and uh, food preparation. And then prior to the 60s and into still today, uh, safflower oil is used as a base for many high value oil paints. So it has uh, many, many uses and many characteristics. And recently, uh, you know, probably within the last 15 years or so, there's been a, imp an 
a greater impact in, in a greater amount of research put into looking at its nutritional characteristics. There are varieties that are high in oleic uh, fatty acids, which are uh, monounsaturated fatty acids, which are good for uh, the cooking industry. And then there's linoleic dominant uh, varieties that have uh, value in salad oils uh, and uh, uh, margarines and, and that type of thing. And then the safflower meal after pressing, uh, it's, it has a pretty high uh, protein content, about 24%. That's very similar to what canola is. Canola can be upwards of 25 or so percent. It's also very high in fiber, and it's used primarily as a, a livestock and poultry feed. You can see with 140,000 acres right now, they're probably not feeding very, very many cows. Uh, so the main purpose has been um, uh, the whole seeds, and that's been used in uh, the birdseed industry. Production in 2011 was 170 million pounds. That was down 23% from 2010. So that was uh, almost 40 million pound decrease. Um, the average yield is uh, right around 1,300 pounds uh, per acre, and that's among all states where it's grown. The average price of safflower in 2011 was about 24 cents a pound. The price in 2010 was 17 cents a pound. From looking at that, I don't have a graph of this, but the fluctuation in safflower prices is very, very high. And the major reason for that is because of the relatively few acres under production, uh, that are under production, and uh, those changes in planted acreage have a big effect on price, right? Because you're not sure what, what the um, availability of, of the seed crop is going to be. It's interesting, though, that if you look at the exports and imports of safflower, the U.S. is a net importer of safflower. And that crop is valued at uh, $42 million in, in 2011, which has increased over, over 2010. And what's interesting to me is that Mexico supplies 87% of all the safflower uh, that, that is imported into the United States. And then we turn around and sell safflower uh, to uh, Japan, and the value of that crop is $15 million. So it seems to me that there's a, a, that a lot could be done to maybe increase production in the U.S. and, and forego some of the imports. If you look at the cultural practices, um, the equipment that's used is very similar to that of small grains. Uh, there is a, a need for uh, the use of pre-emergence herbicides because safflower, uh, although it's a very hardy plant, does not compete well in its very young stages. Uh, it's a, it's a, a spring crop. It has a 100, 120, 150 day uh, crop. Seabed preparation is, uh, is uh, very consistent with that, of, with that of small grains. Typically, you plant uh, in the Columbia Basin, in the lower part of the basin. You can plant it in, in late March, early April. And as you move up to the uh, North Basin, you probably want to be in uh, uh, middle April, end of April. You won't want to go p much past May because uh, you, uh, the chances of getting good uh, uh, crop at harvest is uh, poor. Uh, planting safflower is planted at uh, one to one and a half inches. You don't want to plant it deeper than, than two inches. Row spacing is dependent upon precipitation zone. Uh, typically, if you want a solid uh, planting, uh, like something like this right here, or this is our site down at the Patterson Field site. We plan on uh, six to seven inch uh, uh, row spacing. More dry land uh, areas uh, are planting on 18 to 24 inch rows, so you get uh, more of a, a row spaced uh, uh, effect. Uh, drill settings for safflower are very similar to that, that of barley. It takes about seven to 15 days to emerge. Um, the, uh, I don't know the germination percentage right off, off hand, but it's very much higher than uh, canola is. Uh, it has, that has to do with the larger seed size, I'm sure. 
After emergence, it looks like the plant just quits growing. It'll sit in this rosette stage for about two to, two to four weeks, depending on the environmental conditions. And then you'll get a, a real big flush of growth. And then after that, it starts to branch, and then the flower buds start to show up in, in mid to late June, and it flowers, uh, um, ends of flowering by late, Ju late July. So it's a very long flowering, flowering period. So for fertilization, typically uh, in dry land areas, uh, 50 pounds of nitrogen fertilizer seems to be uh, what the general rule is. That's if they add about five pounds for every 100 pounds of expected seed. Uh, safflower is an exceptional scavenger of nutrients and water. That's hence why it can uh, root very deeply. Uh, in irrigated regions, which I have most, all of my experience with growing safflower, uh, we've looked at anywhere from 100 to 150 pounds of nitrogen per acre under irrigation to maximize the yields. And you also need to, to look at uh, phosphorus nutrition as well. And most all the nutrients you add should be based, based upon the, the soil test. This, for harvest, safflower is generally ready in about 35 days after the final uh, peak flowering. How many here have grown safflower? Yeah, you know that one thing you don't want to do is plug your combine up because it's not a very forgiving crop to flesh. You usually wear Kevlar or, or something like that to get into it. It'd be great to plant around prisons, you know, it, it, because it, it's, it's really, you don't want to do a lot of IPM, but uh, that, that is important in doing it. For uh, harvest, you usually wait till it, it'll turn brown, but there could still be some uh, green in the leaves. But you want it to be at 8% moisture, and that's a pity because a, a safflower is sold on contracts, and if you're much above 8%, there's a, there's a dockage for that. And then on your combine, uh, use uh, low cylinder speeds, less than 500, reel about 25% shaker speed. Keep your concaves about 5 eighths in the front to half in the back. Um, and, and that seems to do a real good job. Uh, rotations, uh, I'm not familiar too much with them in the dryland areas here, and some of you can probably help with that. This is some uh, rotations that I found from uh, Colorado which were winter wheat, safflower going into a fallow, or winter wheat, safflower, barley, uh, or spring wheat, safflower, barley. Uh, you shouldn't really follow safflower in, with safflower in a rotation, uh, or follow things like sunflower, mustards, canola, and that's because of uh, diseases that are common to both, or all, all of those crops. And sclerotinia uh, head rot is, uh, is uh, a big problem in that. And then, you know, just good practice, uh, be sure you have enough soil moisture uh, for planting. One thing about the uh, safflower, it has very little residue, so if you're concerned about soil erosion, water erosion, wind erosion, uh, and you don't already practice it, probably use reduced tillage or some form of uh, chem fallow to help control that. Now, what about yields? Okay, this is, this is Montana, Idaho, and, uh, which are dry land production. And you can see that the range in Montana is from 1,300 to 1,700 pounds per acre. Uh, Idaho is a little bit lower, uh, 1,000 to 1,400 pounds per acre. A lot of this has to do with uh, production with growing degree days. Minimum growing degree days is about 2,200 growing degree days. Columbia Basin is about uh, 2,800 to 3,000 growing degree days, so it fits it fits nicely. Uh, Utah, which is under irrigation, their uh, yield ranges from 15 to 1,800. Finding yield data is a little bit difficult for this crop because it because it hasn't really been reported much uh, by the National Ag Statistics Service, and uh, individual studies are, are are fairly rare. In California, that produces most of uh, uh, safflower, the yields are range between 2,000 and 3,000. And that really depends on what variety you're growing. Either the uh, ones high in uh, oleic acid or linoleic acid uh, will give you different yields. The Washington studies is from our work under irrigation. And uh, it ranged from 2,000 to, to 
almost 2,800 pounds per acre. The 2,000 was one variety that, was, that didn't do well at all. On average, the, the two of the varieties we grew, uh, which is CW990L, uh, that, that's from, uh, uh, and, and one other variety, average right around about 2,800 pounds. And we got some good oil contents that were 34 to 40%. Uh, <clears throat> most of the uh, crop is, is grown under contract and uh, it, oil content minimum is 34%. If you're one percent, if you for every one percent over 34%, there's a premium. For under 34%, there's a dockage, and then, uh, as I said before, uh, water is um, uh, moisture content is real important. Uh, I'll just finish up real quick with weed control. That's really important. That's really important. Uh, annual weeds such as kochia, Russian thistle, and uh, green foxtail uh, really cause you a lot of problem early in the season. Uh, there's also limited herbicides that are available, treflan, uh, sonalan, you know, metachlor, paraquat, those are primarily the ones that are available. Um, and then there, the plant back restrictions are, are real critical to think about too from the previous crop. Uh, safflower has some sensitivities to uh, herbicides like finesse, a stinger, uh, what are the others I have here, uh, harmony, and uh, glean. So you need to be careful about those. So uh, there's a lot of other ways to treat weeds um, within the crop. And then there's only three major pests, cutworms, wireworms, Ligus bugs. In the Columbia Basin, they don't seem to be that much of, much of a problem. We didn't really experience them. There's also three major diseases, which are pythium, which seems to affect every seed that you put in the ground, uh, the sclerotinia head rot, and alternaria. And alternaria by far is probably the worst if you get it, because alternaria can affect any time during the, the life cycle of the, of the safflower. We, uh, either the, both the pythium and sclerotinia are generally early. Okay, so I'll quit there.